So if you have ever worried about the salvation of someone that you love, if you have ever prayed that God would work in the heart of a child or a spouse or a family member or a friend who you believe does not know Jesus, if you've ever wondered what will become of someone that you desperately care about if they don't change their ways or receive some revelation from above, if any of these or any other number of scenarios cause you to worry for your loved ones, perhaps have even kept you up some nights, or caused you distress or discomfort, then you're halfway to understanding the verses that we read this morning. In verse 2 of our reading, Paul says, I have great sorrow and unceasing anguish in my heart for the sake of my people. And I think that nearly all of us could sympathize with his sentiments here. Because we know Jesus and the promises that this brings to us, that should naturally lead to a concern and even worry sometimes for those that we love who have not experienced the same blessing of faith, the same blessing of a lifetime of service to Jesus that we have. Sometimes we wonder how do people who do not have the hope of God on their side cope with life in an uncertain world? And so I think that many of us can perhaps sympathize with the Apostle Paul when we contemplate the lives of those who have not experienced the love of Jesus, when he says that he has bitter grief and incessant anguish in the heart for those that he loves and cares for. We're continuing this morning a series in the letter to the Romans, which was written by the Apostle Paul to the church in Rome. And these verses might be a little bit difficult to read at first. We wonder how they can apply to us. But they actually set up the next three chapters of the book of Romans. And many scholars think that those three chapters are kind of the climax of this entire letter. And Paul is wrestling here with some very important issues. And obviously, as we read in verse 2, this issue causes him a lot of pain and distress and discomfort because it deals with, as we've noted already, his family members, his friends, his teachers, those, his acquaintances, anyone he's ever met, essentially, is affected by this. In this way, we can definitely understand where Paul is coming from, because for many of us, the fate of our own loved ones weighs heavily on our hearts as well. So understanding where we are in the letter to the Romans will help us deal with these important verses. For as I said, they're important to what comes after. But it's also true that they flow out of what has come before. And so we're going to take a moment and we're going to review where we've been in the book of Romans up to this point. Um, And some of you have heard this a few times, and so you're going to be able to recite my outline of the letter to the Romans in your sleep by the end of this, and that's a good thing, I think. So... The reason Paul writes the letter to the Romans is he's introducing himself to the church in Rome. And we know that Paul himself did not uh, found or start the church in Rome, but he wants to come visit it. And in some places, including in today's reading, you can kind of see that Paul is trying to put forward his credentials. He's trying to explain to the people there why they should listen to him. And he's also writing to help deal with a very difficult situation in that church. And we've said this a few times, but it's quite important to today's verses and also in the ones that come after today. The church in Rome was suffering from a very tense situation that arose because the Jewish Christians, who were the first followers after Jesus, who had started the church and had leadership of that church, Uh, All the Jews were ordered out of the city of Rome by order of the Emperor Claudius about 40 uh, common era, which is just after about a decade after Jesus lived. And so when the Jewish Christians were gone, the only people left in the church were the Gentile Christians. And so they took over leadership of the church. And after this emperor's death, the, the Jews were allowed to come back to the city. So the Jewish Christians came back to the city, back to their church, and found that there was already other leadership in place. And Jewish people and Gentile people expressed their faith in Jesus slightly differently. And, uh, and so there's tension between the two groups as they try and work out who should lead and, and how uh, they should express their uh, love for Jesus in this particular church. <clears throat> 
So in our letter so far, we have dealt with the news that all people are guilty before God. God has pronounced judgment on everyone. But onto this backdrop of human guilt, God also pronounces the good news that his righteousness has come to earth in the person of Jesus. And through Jesus, this is available to all who believe. Because of Jesus, we've been freed from the anger of God. We've been freed from being slaves to sin. We've been freed from the demands of the law. We've even been freed from death. Now, last week, uh, when we looked at the verses that we were looking at, we talked about how it was almost like climbing a mountain and being able to look out uh, from a different vista and seeing the perspective of things from God above. And it said there that God does not allow anything in all creation to separate us from his love. But if you look at today's passage, and they follow right on one another in the, in the book, we didn't skip anything. There's quite a difference between the end of Romans chapter 8, No, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. That's from last week, the end of chapter 8. And after this beautiful declaration, the confident assurance that nothing in all creation can separate us from the love of God, we go immediately to Romans 9, to Paul's bitter sorrow and unending grief. That's quite the turnaround in just two verses. Almost gives you a little bit of whiplash there. One writer says it's difficult to imagine a more dramatic plunge from the heights of exaltation found in chapter 8 to the depths of pain and agony expressed here. But this writer goes on to say, paradoxically, the source of both the exaltation and the pain and anguish are the same. We're dealing with God's gracious fidelity to God's people. So why does Paul cycle so rapidly from the assurance that nothing in all creation can separate us from the love of God to this sorrow and anguish that he carries in his heart for those, his kinsmen, the, his family members? Because both of them deal with the same question about the character and nature of God. Paul is asking this very important question. Is God faithful? Will God keep his promises that he has made? It's a very unfortunate reality that much of the Christian church history has been stained with the sin of anti-Semitism. The great reformer Martin Luther, while doing much good, unfortunately was very vocal about his hatred of the Jewish people to the point where Hitler and the Nazi party used a number of his writings to justify the things that they did against the Jews in World War II. And Luther, I single him out, but he's not alone. There are many examples of people in church history and very uh, prominent church leaders who do this very thing, who, who promote hatred against the Jewish people. That's hard to get from the New Testament, however, because Paul, we read about, his heart bleeds and breaks for his people, his kinsmen, who were chosen from God from the very beginning. Theirs, he says, is the adoption to sonship. Theirs is the divine glory. Theirs are the covenants and the receiving of the law and the temple worship and the promises and the patriarchs. One of the commentators noted that all of those blessings, Paul says, in other places in Romans um, are also available to Gentiles as well. However, the Jews were there first. They, it was their promises before they were our promises. And the end of our scripture reading here, and one of the most important points Paul is making one of the biggest blessings of the Jewish people is that it is through the Jews that Jesus himself traces his ancestry. One of the things that we Christians very conveniently forget a lot is that Jesus was a Jew. One writer says Jesus didn't just come in the flesh, he came in Jewish flesh. God became incarnate as a Jew 
as a covenantal heir to the long lineage of a people who have known God's presence and contended with God through thick and thin. So here Paul is launching into an argument about what happens to his kinsmen, the Israelites, in light of the coming of Jesus Christ. So we're talking about Israel here, but the truth is that the argument he is making is a lot less about Israel and more about the character of God. An acquaintance of mine became a youth pastor in a denomination that doesn't uh, believe women should be ministers. And so someone said to him, well, how do you reconcile that with your belief that, you know, you think that women should be in ministry? And he said, well, I'm not really a woman, so it doesn't really affect me all that much. But that doesn't seem like a very satisfactory answer. Martin Luther King Jr. once said, injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. And so I think it's wrong for us to be so self-focused to believe that things like rights for other people, even if they don't directly affect us, should not be a goal for us all to strive for. And yet, have we been guilty of this regarding the Jewish people? Because we're Christians, because we're not Jews, do we really care that much about their fate? Even if we haven't been guilty, of anti-Semitism or hatred of the Jewish people, and unfortunately that's not a given in today's world. There's still many people out there who express hatred toward the Jewish people. But even if we're not guilty of hating them, have we been guilty of simply not caring about them very much because their fate doesn't directly affect our fate, which we believe is sealed in Jesus Christ? And of course, I believe it is. I'm not saying that it's not. But even if, you, if Paul here, even if his anguish doesn't touch your own heart, this is an issue we need to care about because we are talking about the same God. Again, this argument is less about the Israelites and more about the character of God. One writer says, Paul has just finished making strong claims about God's reliability. All things work together for the good of those who love God, who have been called according to his purpose. That's Romans 8.28. And nothing in creation will be able to separate us from the love of God. Romans 8.39. But we would have good reason to doubt those claims if it's the case that God has given up on the Jewish people. God must honor all those things, all those promises that he has lavished upon the Jewish people as named here in our scripture reading. If not, then how will Gentile Christians be able to trust that God won't cancel the promises he makes to us? So for that reason alone, I think we cannot be cavalier about our attitude toward Israel, the chosen people of God. Now, I want to be very clear that we can't take Paul's statements written in Romans and in other places in the New Testament to the first century people as a political blueprint for the modern issues that surround the Jewish people and the country of Israel today. Now, I'm sure many of you have heard the news from that area of the world and been troubled about it because things there are conflicted and complicated and difficult. But the ancient Bible isn't a blueprint for modern politics. We can't expect Paul to give uh, predictions about the contemporary Israel. But yet, Romans 9 through 11 provokes us to think about what it means for the nation of Israel to be the people of God. So even though we cannot take the ancient Bible as a modern blueprint, I think that we also cannot drop the Jewish people off our radar entirely and believe that we've succeeded in taking their place in God's eyes, as if they don't count anymore. And this is the area that Paul covers in Romans 9 through 11. And I am most especially saying that we cannot promote hatred toward the Jewish people in any form. One writer says this, Paul never surrenders the goodness and the righteousness of God God's goodness keeps reasserting itself so that finally he almost gives up the explanations and just simply says it's a mystery. God will never abandon Israel. How can you abandon your own? How can a parent give up on a child? 
nor will God, nor does Paul. Paul's understanding of God is his ultimate answer, even when he's at a loss to know how it's all going to work out. He refuses to entertain the notion that God will write Israel off. All that is very radical, and Christians soon abandon such daring. There was a very famous figure in church history who wanted to take our Bible and lop off the first three quarters. He wanted to cut out the Old Testament as we refer to it. But the church as a whole very wisely condemned this move and actually deemed that person to be a heretic. Now, to be fair, a lot of people were deemed heretics for a lot of reasons in those days. Though, come to think of it, I'm not sure we've come all that far, really. But we have acknowledged as a church that to understand Judaism is important to our understanding of Jesus that our understanding of the New Testament grows from the Old Testament. It is very important that we don't lop it off and pretend it never existed. It's foundational to our understanding. In fact, if you remember back when the reason I was in Chicago uh, at the beginning of July, um, I was studying a class called uh, Judaism as New Testament Context, and so that was deemed foundational to our entire degree that I'm taking, the fact that New Testament uh, writings grew out of Judaism. The best way to understand the New Testament and to understand Jesus is to know that he was a Jew, and this was a Jewish world. And we, as Christians, share a history and a heritage with the Jewish people. And so we cannot write them off so quickly. The story that we talked about with the children this morning illustrates the world of the Jewish people. Genesis 32 with Jacob who wrestles with God overnight. Uh, I told the story to the children so I won't retell it now. But it's here that Jacob gets his name. That becomes the name for the entire people. He gets the name Israel which means God wrestler. And God blesses him. One writer says this about that story. God and Israel have quite a history together, as rocky as any passionate relationship. But it's a relationship established by divine promises, promises made, reiterated throughout the entire scripture. So the story from Genesis about Jacob wrestling with God, contending with him, might tell us about how we can also wrestle with God, as Jacob does. But it also tells us that God is willing to wrestle with us and is willing to wrestle with the people of Israel, his chosen people, and he's determined to bless them and through them to bless all people. The history of Israel demonstrates God's long-standing graciousness, and it becomes a history in which Christians share a history and a future determined by God. You see, God in his wisdom and his great love has chosen to include more than just the Jewish people in his blessing. In John 4, Jesus talks with a woman at a well who's a Samaritan woman and says, Believe me, woman, the time is coming when you Samaritans will worship the Father neither here at this mountain nor there in Jerusalem. You worship guessing in the dark. We Jews worship in the clear light of day. God's way of salvation is made available through the Jews. But the time is coming, he says, and in fact has come, when what you are called will not matter, and where you go to worship will not matter. That's where he says, the Father is looking for people who will worship him in spirit and in truth. In John 10, 16, Jesus says, I have other sheep who are not of this sheep pen. I must bring them also, and they too will listen to my voice, and there will be one flock and one shepherd. So those are words from Jesus' own mouth that he wants to add to his family, to his chosen people. In in Romans, Paul says that Jesus is the firstborn of many brothers and sisters, that he intends to bless all people. And in Revelation, in the vision of the great restored city of God, Uh, John has the vision that he says, After this I looked, and there before me was a great multitude that no one could count from every nation, tribe, people, and language standing before the Lamb and before the throne. 
So we see in the end there will be people from all nations, tribes, languages, tongues. One commentator says there's a simultaneous narrowing and expansion of God's action in history. God called a single individual, Abraham, and promised to bless all the world through him. There's a progressive expansion in God's promise. So we know that God intends to bless the whole world. He intends to include us in the promises that he initially gave to his chosen people, the Israelites. And we can be thankful for that. We can rejoice in that. But we must never, ever take God's generosity for granted. And that comes out a little bit more in the passages that follow this. But we cannot assume that we're superior to God's chosen people because he is gracious enough to include us. Instead, we need to rejoice in his generosity and the hospitality he's extended to us. The church shares a root, a root of God's faithfulness. We do not appropriate Israel's rich heritage of adoption, covenants, and promises, but we participate in them in a real way through Jesus Christ. God has been gracious to us and included us in his promises. And Paul wants to tell us that these promises are trustworthy because God is trustworthy because God will fulfill these promises. That's the kind of God that we serve. You will notice today that we have set before us the table of the Lord. And I think that it's fitting that we celebrate communion today as we consider the generosity of God, who through Jesus Christ opened the promises that he gave to the Israelites, to us as well, who gathered us all in so that we could be one flock with one shepherd, as Jesus says. One writer says the people of God are called to a particular way of life. Do justice, love kindness, walk humbly with your God, protect the weak, feed the poor, free the slaves, welcome the alien. The sovereign God calls each of us to a larger community that's characterized by what he calls fellow feeling, that is, we trust ourselves to God alone, and we become responsible for one another. God's, uh, God shows no favoritism. He welcomes all. How radical is that divine inclusivity? It's so inclusive that even the ritually impure Gentiles and pagan idolaters become part of the people of God. And because of that, it's our job as God's people to reflect his character, and to become a welcoming people as well. So as we go to the table of the Lord today, I just want us to be very thankful that God has been generous, has opened up a way to us, for us, to him, to the person of Jesus Christ. As it says in the Old Testament, all people have been blessed through Abraham, through the Jewish people, because through them came Jesus, our Lord and our Messiah. So let's pray together as we go together to the table of the Lord this morning. Almighty God, we thank you so much that you are faithful to all promises that you have given all throughout history. We thank you that we can trust you for the promises that you've made to us because you've been faithful in the past. We thank you, Lord, that all our hearts are open to you. All our desires are known and that we hold no secrets from you. We ask that you would cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. We ask that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name. Through Jesus Christ our Lord we pray. Amen.